front of you, you can see my deck. And what I just want to kind of introduce this hashtag that we're going to add to our wit and the hashtags that we use for wit, and that's always be learning. And I think if anything that we've learned over the last year is that um, you can never learn enough. You can never know too much because things are always changing and th things happen so quickly. So always be learning, using this as an opportunity to get exposed to different things, I think is hugely valuable. Just a little ups um, info about the WIT network, so you know who we are. We've got a LinkedIn group, we've got a Facebook group, but just so everybody on the call knows, we are part of a global network. You are more than welcome to go to that, um, that website down there, very easy to remember, the witnetwork.com. You're welcome to join the global network as well. There is a, I think, um, with the current exchange rate, the membership fee is around 980 Rand. And then you get invited to global events, which are hugely insightful. Um, and it's something that um, you can really enjoy. Um, so this is who we are for those that are joining for the first time. And just uh, the, our South African WIT network, we've got three focus areas. Um, and you'll see uh, the topics that we choose and the speakers that we have kind of cover all of these areas. And so self-development, it's your own self-development, networking, knowledge sharing, etc. Enabling um, the next generation of girls and getting more people into the IT field in any area. And then your leadership development. So that's what our purpose is. Um, and today we have um, a little task for all of you is just to, to drive this amongst yourselves. So invite people to join us. Make sure you've joined our LinkedIn group in particular because that's where a lot of the action happens. The Facebook group is just more for FYI. Um, and then you put your hand up if you want to share your insights and ideas. If you've got um, a topic you'd really like to discuss, if you've got information you really want to share, please, we're always looking for speakers. And without further ado, I'm going to kick off. And you might be surprised why I haven't put a description for Karika, and that's because I can sum it up in three words. Maybe it's four. Master, oh no, just three. Master of everything. Karika is a developer. She's also an incredible people person, and she's a sports person. So she like ticks every box that you come across. Um, and she's just a valuable addition to the WIT um, network, as well as helping me drive it in South Africa. And I'm really excited to kick off this um, technical edition with Karik. So if I can just go straight over to you, and then I'll come back and introduce Taryn just now. So 100%. Sorry, I'm testing out a new lightning. Lighting here at the moment, it seems to be a bit on the bright side, but nevertheless. Cool. Um, yeah, so welcome to this first edition of Tech Smarter with Karika. Um, and the first one I've appropriately named the Home Edition. So basically, I want to look at elements of your home setup and to see, um, you know, what you can do differently. Because this is something that comes up quite often at around a dinner table, where people ask me, like, you know, how do I do things? You know, what could I suggest? You know, and you know, how, how can I help them? You know, use technology um, even more. Sorry. Um, the main idea we're focusing on hardware today is other items that you can make something you can build yourself um, or buy. The biggest drive for everything, um, you know, that I would like to suggest to you is value for money. Um, although I'm not, you know, entirely, or, you know, want to always just spend money uh, or from throw money at a problem, you know, sometimes, you know, it's really, um, you know, worth it to, to spend that few extra bucks, you know, and get more value for it. Um, as Lauren so kindly introduced me, um, um, yeah, this is um, just something short. I am a developer and yeah, love sport and also love sharing my knowledge about tech with other people. Um, if you want to connect with me I, either on LinkedIn or on Twitter, uh, there are my handles. And yeah, let's get on with it. 
So when I was at varsity, one of the subjects that I had was economics. And this was really something that piqued my interest. Um, and if you look at the economic society of Europe, um, they say that economics is about fit. The fit between people, the things they do, objects they use, and the environment they work, travel, or play in. If a good fit is achieved, the stresses on people are reduced, they are more comfortable, and they can do things more, you know, faster, more easily, and make fewer mistakes. So if you look at your current home office um, or work office setup, um, and just like any good teammate or colleague, does it set you up for success? Let's look at some ways that you could maybe, you know, get a better economic fit for yourself. One of the ways of doing that is getting a separate keyboard and mouse. But then just go for the cheapest or first, uh, you know, set that you get on the internet. Look for something that's got programmable buttons. That could be either on the keyboard itself or on the mouse. So, for example, if you, let me just get my laser point here. If you see here, there's, for example, a few buttons here that's just um, marked like A, B, um, and C that you can program to anything that you want to, whether it's to copy paste items, to open a tab or a specific website or a program. Um, as you can see, this is quite a very old keyboard of mine. You know, it's still got Windows Media Center. But because all these buttons are reprogrammable, I can program it to whatever I need to. I even have a very nice ergonomic mouse, you know, with a nice thumb groove. Um, but for example, if you don't, you know, if you mainly work just on your mouse, for example, like graphic designers, and there's specific tools that you use quite often, you can even invest in like a mouse that's got various buttons on, on it. So you might say, okay, no, but I'm not a gamer. I'm not in need of what this, like 12 buttons on a mouse, you know, that's overkill. You can get mouse a mice with just, for example, two buttons that you can use. Um, if you've got now a separate um, keyboard and mouse and you've got now all these shortcut keys, you know, that also helps you to more, um, you know, with a better posture when you work on your computer, especially when you've got more than one screen or you use your laptop in, for example, an elevated position. So what's the benefits of having a computer in an elevated position? Well, first, it brings the webcam up to more to an eye level. So instead of having to look, down, um, you know, with the webcam looking from, I want to say from, you know, under you up, you can now look face it head on. Um, and again, you know, you'll feel the difference in your um, neck as well, because you're not looking down at the camera the whole time. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, I lost my space. Okay. Yeah, so for propping up the laptop, um, you can either just have a few stack books, you know, to get that laptop a bit higher. You can build like, for example, a custom laptop stand like this one on the builder's side, which is quite nice because it's got added space to put your keyboard underneath it. So then you've got more desk space if you still prefer to work with a pen and paper every now and again. Um, or you can purchase, for example, off of um, websites like a one with fans built in, which I've got, which is nice because it prevents a computer from overheating. And um, you've got additional uh, USB hubs, so you can plug in an additional printer or um, USB sticks, you know, whatever you might need. Um, so because most of my communication also happens on Microsoft Teams, it also means that I've got lots of um, video and audio calls that I have to deal with. So getting an external speaker and mic was of a, you know, huge importance to me. Um, I settled for the, um, uh, sorry, Yaelink uh, CP700, and which is nice. It's got like an answer and end button, volume buttons on top of the device, but almost the most important one is the mute button. Yes, I still forget to unmute myself, but this one also, you can see there's a thin green line around, which is actually a LED. So when you're on mute, that goes on a nice red color. Um, it's also got Bluetooth, so I can connect with my phone to it. So when I do get a, um, a call on my cell phone, I can answer it on the device itself, um, which is a huge help for me. Um, the nice thing is this can also, for example, if I were to go back to the office and I have a small meeting between like five and eight people, um, this can be used in a meeting like that. 
and makes it um, because of the um, microphones that's all around the device. You know, you can everybody can be heard clearly during a meeting. And again, if you need to mute it and discuss something in private with the people in the room, you can do that as well. If you, for example, share your workspace at home with others, you can also invest in a headset with a microphone, which gives you the same advantage, um, with the exception that other people don't have to, you know, will also hear your conversations. But just to also, like, if you've got privacy concerns or just want to always make sure that, you know, um, are you using the correct camera if you've got more than one uh, webcam? Or, you know, that you don't accidentally switch on your camera, people see that when you were not ready for that meeting, then you can use a physical barrier um, or device to stop your web, you know, to um, screen your webcam. These thing, um, little stickers that you put on um, has got a little window that you can just slide across. And they've got an added benefit, for example, when I do video calls, I know to look at that webcam cover to say, you know, that I look at the camera nicely and not, for example, um, just at the people's faces, for example, in a video call. Um, these are also great branding tools. So if your company is looking for a, um, a nice promotional gift to give to people that they'll definitely use, uh, I can definitely recommend the webcam cameras. And um, as I mentioned, I'm playing around a bit with the lighting because during the day I've got good um, outside lighting coming from the window behind me, but now, coming towards an evening, you know, the lighting is not so great. Initially, I just used a small tail lamp that I had lying around at home and removed the cover or the, the what do you call, uh, sorry, lampshade, and um, used that to, you know, get more light closer to me. And I put that just behind my laptop, behind the webcam. Um, to try and get additional lighting, I've now invested in a small video, um, light and this LED light is about 450 bucks and comes with two different diffusers. Currently I'm using the orange one um, just to give it a bit of a softer light and not as a fluorescent one. Um, whether it works or not, <laughs> that I still need to play around and maybe you know tweak it a bit more. But it's you know if you need additional lighting sources you can even look at something like a flashlight or you know, if you've got like a small lantern of top, these LED lanterns, um, anything that you can use to maybe just improve the lightning, lighting, across, you know, around you. So maybe you want to take your home to the next level, and that's maybe doing it, you know, going for a smart home. I personally am a huge fan of the Google Home Minis. These are small speakers that you can um, have in your house that's just a bit bigger than a donut. And you can ask it, you know, all sorts of questions like, you know, what's the weather like? Do I need an umbrella? What does my calendar look like today? What the latest news is? Or, you know, even to play some music. Um, but, you know, just having the speaker was not enough for me because, you know, sometimes you want to visually see things and not just um, get it um, an audio feedback on it. And for that, I purchased a Google Chromecast. So if you've got an older TV that's not a smart one, so that means that you can't stream to it or it doesn't connect to the internet, a Google Chromecast is a good cheap, um, not a cheap, but alternative um, solution. This is, for example, the Google third generation Chromecast. Uh, they retail for anything about um, 700 to 1,200 Rand. So compare that to a brand new TV, you know, that you would need to weigh up. But for me, it was a good way to make my TV smart. And um, what I enjoy doing is, for example, like webinars like this one, I would just go and cast it from um, the browser, for example, if I use Teams on the um, on the browser, um, just to cast the content onto a TV. This way I can easily share like an interesting webinar with, you know, my family members. Um, or just have it, um, watch it on a bigger screen, um, sitting back on a couch. Then load shedding. It's an unfortunate way of life for many South Africans. And I just quickly wanted to touch on it because when I started on this presentation, um, you know, we still had load shedding. And yeah, luckily that has stopped for the time being. But um, 
what in essence I needed to do or my requirements were that I wanted to be able to work from home, you know, even when there's load shedding um, without having to drive into the office. So one of the first things I needed to do was to sort out my internet. Um, and then I found these micro UPSs on the internet, which in essence is a power bank for your um, internet. So because I've got fiber internet and I use, um, for example, Vumatel with the MWeb as my um, internet provider, um, this little power bank sits um, between the electric, you know, the wall socket, if I can call it like that. And then I've got both the router as well as the CPE connected to that. And that covers me for more than four and a half hours um, of um, uptime, you know, for my internet. Um, which is great because, you know, with our um, load shedding that was previously four hours, now down to two, you know, I'm well covered. Um, what's nice is also that this has got a USB port, so you can, you know, charge, for example, um, your mobile device if you're running low on power. Um, they say also that you can um, charge your laptop from it, although this is something that I would still like to try and do. I have not been able yet to get the cable for it. but um, you know, it's definitely useful to know that you've got that capability. Um, you do get various uh, different types of micro UPSs and also different sizes, um, but that all depends on your own requirements. Um, just a quick thing, when you're looking for power options or backup power options for your um, home, when working from home, there's three main um, categories that I would like to, you know, just inform you about. A UPS which is great if you just quickly want to save the work that you, you know, busy working with and to safely switch off your computer. This is anything from 10 to half an hour that it allows you to, you know, safely um, log off your um, electronic devices. This is not a good option if you want to continue working. If you want to continue working while, you know, there is load shedding, I would either suggest the option two of, or the third one which is the inverter of batteries or a generator. And again, a lot of these things depend on how many items you want to uh, power during this period and what the cost is. Um, so maybe this is something that you're all interested in. We could, I could maybe do a f more research on this and maybe do a talk on that. Otherwise, I just wanna say, you know, see which one of those three options um, work for your situ situation. Um, cool. Then, um, yeah, let me know if you've implemented any of these changes at your home or even your work office and use the hashtag TechSmarts with Karika and let me know um, what you did to make your life easier. <laughs> Thanks for listening and yeah, if there's any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Karika. That was so insightful. Just judging on the comments, I think you've really sparked conversation and thought. And um, just incidentally, we ran a survey at Mint um, earlier this year to ask that question. And as a result, we landed up um, doing bulk orders for small and medium sized inverters. Um, I'm one of the people that got a small inverter and it actually has really been a game changer and just to your point it's not that i don't like going to the office but i like to go at my convenience not at load sheddings demand so um I, I, you know i'm sure there are a few other minties on the call that can that can also attest to having a having an inverter and and just how effective that really is um, I see there was a lot of comment on the side, especially just around your desk setups. And a few of you kindly shared photos of your current um, balancing acts. I think it was Michelle and Taryn. Um, I'm in your club. My, my monitor currently rests on a whole lot of my old Judy books, Judy manuals. I'm sure those, some of you might uh, remember. Just feedback there in terms of your very first picture with all the measurements about ergonomics. Can you just go into a little bit of detail there? What is the impact of poor ergonomics? Um, or, you know, I just saw Vanessa talking about standing desk, the benefit of standing, et cetera. Perhaps just share a little bit more insight there. So the biggest thing is um, initially when I was um, studying, the big thing was always like, 
when you put out your hands, you know, it's your lap, oh, your screen, you know, you know, arms left, uh, sorry, uh, arms length away from you. Um, you know, if you're sitting, you know, is your knees at a 90 degree? So I'm also going to say there's lots of schools of thought around that. And because I'm not a, um, a medical expert, you know, I, I can't really um, speak much to it. But the biggest thing is, is that you try to be as um, mindful of the way, you know, you work. If you, you know, like I said, previously it was always that when you have to answer the phone, that is it in the arm's length away from you? Um, we know, for example, what do you work mostly with today? You know, is it, for example, that your mouse or your keyboard is sitting maybe too high, that your elbows are going a little bit too high? Or, um, you know, is it, you know, the table not right? Um, for example, because of, I'm very short, you know, my office chair at work wasn't suitable. Um, and, you know, when they got the, the suppliers out, you know, they actually had to remove, I don't know, gas strut or something within it just to make it go lower. So I also want to say the biggest thing is just to be mindful of what do you need? You know, if your neck is sore or um, you have lower back pain, you know, is it maybe a chair? Is it maybe the fact that you're working on a laptop and don't have a separate keyboard and mouse and, you know, that you're sitting like all cramped up, you know, because everything's not nice spaced out. And that's one of the great benefits of having a fully, um, you know, a full keyboard, you know, with a numpad, um, depending on whether you use it, of course. But for example, just to have that more space and not as cramped as, for example, a 13 inch laptop would be. So, um, I, yeah. I, I um, hope that answers your question to no, a certain absolutely. extent. I'm not sure um, anyone else. I see Michelle made a very good comment, also having frequent breaks, which is very, very um, important. Um, I think the keyboard thing is a huge one. I, 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 I realise, listening to you now, how hunched I am over my small keyboard, and you become so used to that you don't realise that you are hunching. Um, Instead of asking questions, I just want to put it out there to everyone. Who else has got like a really good ergonomic setup that they want to talk about? I know we've had a few people talking about their standing desks. Um, does anybody else, anyone using those speaker options that Karika mentioned or have specific lighting that they um, they rave about? Uh, Lauren, Jandre, yeah. Um... Jandre. I sit on a ball chair, which I love. Uh, one of those Ron Pilates <laughs> balls. Yeah, I'll take a picture <laughs> and share it with you. Um, and why do you do that? It just keeps your posture up. Um, uh, and you don't hunch as much as on a chair. Okay. And, and it's just nice and you can bounce up and down if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you know, you're meeting, you falling question. asleep. Do, do you give a lot of work done? Because I must say, last year of lockdown, I tried the balls one. Well, I must say, I had so much fun. I was bouncing and like put music on. And I must say, yeah. you know, work just didn't happen that well. <laughs> so yeah, I so back I, to property. <laughs> I used to sit on a, only a ball, but then um, I did what you just said. So I now have a ball chair, which is still fun, but um, yeah. More yeah, work gets done. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a more work friendly chair. <laughs> but yes, I, I tend to jump a lot on my ball chair. And it's good exercise and it gives you a few steps. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, share, I'll share my, my chair with you. Um, yeah, yes. that's one thing I invested in way early in lockdown because I tend to get lower back pains. Yeah. And it's much better now. Um, you still need to on your posture though but yes yeah. i think the posture thing is huge i see natasha just made a comment about struggling with back pain and i mean if you think about how much time we spend in our office chairs um i think it's hugely important um samantha harrison i see you've posted a picture of one of those kneeling chairs yes tell us about that um so I have chronic pain, so the ball doesn't always work. Some days I'm just too sore for that. Sometimes I get really tired, so then I feel like I'm going to fall off the ball. Um, so I've got a knee chair as well. Um, you, you can't 
fall off, but you also can't um, get tired sitting on it because you're actually supporting yourself with you sitting on your bum and on your shins. Um, it forces you to stay up straight. Um, and I find that my back doesn't get as tired sitting on that one. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, listen, guys, I do think I see Sam has said here about the Herman Miller chairs. I think it's something you need to invest in. Um, a good office chair or a good um, office setup is going to cost you something. I'm looking at Vanessa's um, standing desk setup. You know, um, it's it, there is some cost involved, but in terms of, you know, how much time we already had Bridget Sutton, the chiropractor, speaking to us last year, um, September or October, imagine how much time you'd be spending with a chiropractor and a physio if you're not sitting correctly and not at the right height and all of those. So thank you, Karika. Hugely, hugely insightful. Um, Lauren, you're just a quick thing on that. The biggest thing is, so yes, you can buy, for example, like the desk stand products that are great. I must say, I've bought a, a desk, a, a, sorry, a standing desk that you mount directly against the wall. And although there's great options, but you can also start with something you do yourself. So, you know, for example, even if it's just using, I see a lot of users, uh, people have posted about the books that they post. So if you can't buy a standing desk at this stage, maybe just try and elevate um, your current uh, setup just a bit higher and see whether it works for you. Because maybe, you know, the idea of a standing desk is great, but maybe it doesn't suit you. So I just want to say before investing too much money, Try and see if you can't do a DIY option just to, mm. you know, get a feel for it. Absolutely. Love it. So now um, it's the end of the month, which means everyone's been paid. So take a lot's going to ping quite a bit now with some um, keyboards or lights or speakers or what have you. Um, thank you, Karika. Very insightful. I'm looking forward to learning from you each month on this technical slot. I think it's really going to be great. So thanks so much. Thanks, Lauren. And I'll be going through the chats now and responding to people. So thank you very much. Awesome. Fantastic. OK, so I want to introduce our next um, our next speaker is a very, very interesting lady, um, Taryn. And what I just really, really loved, I've put, I've put a um, description up from her website here. And I can't wait for her to explain the managing director of MBA Yogini. That just sounds like a very awesome dream job. Um, but essentially, what really appealed to me about inviting Taryn to speak is just around the progress that is being made and what is still to be done in gender parity. We, as a group, as an organization have done so much in our individual capacities within our own companies to really drive um, gender representation and inclusion. And um, that I think it's great to kind of get a 15,000 foot view from somebody like Taryn, who's looking at it um, almost from a, a, a combination of an academic and commercial point of view. So Taryn, thank you very much for joining us today. I know that you, um, you've you got a few power issues. Yeah. So um, hopefully <laughs> everything holds out and um, we're able to keep going. But welcome today. And um, it's wonderful to have you join us. And I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. And yes, I have uh, copper cables that have been stored in our, in our street, so they are busy repairing them now. I have an inverter on, it's making a loud noise. You can just let me know if you can't hear me okay, and I'll change headsets, but I think this gaming one is the best one I can use. No, we're for good now. for now, you sound clear, thank you. Okay. Fantastic. And yeah, thank you for the introduction, and Karika, thank you for the presentation. Um, I learned a lot. And I guess we're going to take quite an interesting turn in a different di direction um, and maybe looking at the ergonomics of, you know, our minds and how maybe after what I've shown you today, we can sit up a little taller when it comes to how, you know, we think in our brains. So, yes, the, the concept of ergonomics, but in a, in a very different realm. So I'm just going to share my 
uh, this stop here quickly. Okay, I think that should be coming through. You can just give me a thumbs up if you can see that in the chat. Yes, you can. Okay, fantastic. So, um, yes, again, great to virtually meet you all. Um, I normally do these uh, talks with my business partner, Roz. She, she's not here with us today, so it's just me. But Roz and I run a, a small consultancy called Chapter Network. Um, and we've been working with organizations over the past 13 years to really unlock latent potential and ultimately to improve the work life experience um, of everyone by encouraging inclusion and diversity. So um, I'd love to share more about that with, with all of you. If you're interested, you can just ping me in and I'll tell you more about Chapter Network. Um, we don't like formal introductions. Uh, so we like to really disarm everyone and almost present ourselves in a way that if you really know me, then you would know that, dot, dot, dot. So Roz there, the woman wearing black on the right of the screen, she's my business partner. I introduce her as a mother, a management consultant, and a mega mentor. She's done it all in her secret sources and her deep understanding of how adults learn. Um, and she really leaves people forever changed, whether they like it or not. Um, and introducing myself, uh, I see some of my uh, my day job colleagues on the call. So I've been at Dimension Data, now Entity Limited, for 11 years. Um, but this is my side hustle. So I'm not wearing my uh, day job hat today. I'm wearing my Chapter Network side hustle hat today. But I'm also a mother. Um, but if you really knew me, you'd know that I cried both times my sons were born. I wished for girls. Um, but now deep in my heart, I know that my mission is to raise boys who are aware of the past, the patriarchy, and the potential of the new world. So, yeah, really grateful to be here with you today um, because I definitely believe that the world becomes a better place one conversation at a time. So the theme of this presentation is to talk about International Women's Day. Um, as you all know, 8th of March, International Women's Day, it's International Women's Hi History Month. There's a lot of pomp and circumstance. The spotlight has really shone on women and the women's agenda in the world. And I thought it would be important to introduce, you know, what is the, um, what is the theme of International Women's Day and how did it come about? So apologies if, if a lot of you have heard about this already. I'll, I'll race through it quite quickly. Um, so. International Women's Day originated in the early 1900s, actually, but became an official national day uh, a couple of decades later, in about the 1940s. Um, and its purpose is to just celebrate women's achievements, uh, raise awareness against bias, and take action for equality. Um, so it's a global day. We don't only celebrate in South Africa. We've also got um, a Women's Day in August, which has a different take. Uh, but internationally, this day is celebrated um, to really focus on the social, economic, and cultural, as well as political achievements of women around the world. Um, and uh, it's really significantly witnessed worldwide as groups come together to celebrate these women's achievements. Um, and because, uh, you know, women and the women's agenda has become very popular in pop culture, it's getting more and more airtime. It's important to know that each year there's a theme, and this year's theme is Choose to Challenge. And the premise is that a challenged world is an alert world, and from challenge comes change. So I really hope that today uh, you might decide that you will choose to challenge, and maybe you will think a little bit more about how you can help forge a gender equal world. So jumping into um, you know, expanding outside of just International Women's Day. It's a part of many global initiatives. So the first one I want to bring to your attention is the World Economics Forum, the World Economic Forum's agenda um, and focus on women and work, um, as well as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, um, number 17, number five rather, of 17 of these goals, which is gender equality. So to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And when we look at these two massive organizations that are campaigning and organizing and working on cha changing the status quo, um, just some interesting facts to bring to your attention. So on the left there, you've got the World Economic Forum, and they've got something called the Gender Gap Calculator. So I'm giving away my age here, 
but I popped in my birthday and it spat out to me that I'd be 204 years old when the world has reached um, or bridged the gender gap based on the current rate of change. So as we all know, that's definitely not fast enough. And uh, I've been looking at this gender, gap, this gender gap calculator for years and that number just keeps getting bigger. And then if we look at the UN information um, on the SDG for gender equality, you can see that things are getting progressively worse. And now with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we see that things um, are deteriorating at a rapid pace. So women bear additional household burdens during the pandemic for many different reasons. And there are many, many hours spent on unpaid, what is known as women's work. Um, most of the people at the front line dealing with the pandemic of the coronavirus are women. Um, and the scariest one is the massive increase of violence against women and girls since we've been in lockdowns across the world. So um, things aren't looking super great, but I have lots of good stuff to tell you. But let's just watch a very quick video to see things from maybe a different perspective that we haven't considered. You're getting a lot of fans here. A lot of them are female. And they want to know if you could date anyone in the world. Who would you date? Any response to recent comments about your girlish figure? Are you serious? Removing your body hair gives you an edge in the pool. How about your love life? How has your weight gain affected your mobility? I don't know what about. I don't know what about. Have you heard the controversy over your helmet hair? <laughs> Get ready to see some great biceps, tiny tanks, and more. I wonder, does Dad send to him when he was younger? Listen, you're never going to be a looker, you're never going to be a Beckham, so you have to compensate for that. He really does have the kind of body international judges love. Could you give us a twirl and tell us about your outfit? What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Bro, I'm out, man. Tell us about your outfit. A twirl, like a twirl, a pirouette. Here we go. Okay. So I guess the point that we're trying to make here is that we are not treated equally. And yes, there's stark facts and figures, but dangerously and more often. It's very subtle. So what I hope we can look at here is just a couple of the facts before we go into the subtleties. And here we're just going to compare the world versus South Africa. So if you look at the world, the gender pay gap is currently sitting at around 23% at an average. So that's 77 cents to the dollar. What that means is that for every, every dollar a man earns for the same work, a woman earns 77 cents. When we look at senior management stats across the globe, the number of women from a percentage perspective is sitting at around 29%, a drop from 33% about five years ago. Only 37 of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. That's 7%. And the global sex ratio is uh, sitting at around 1%. So what that means is that there are slightly more men than women, but it's basically 50-50. Um, and 35% of women are represented in STEM studies. So that's just kind of giving you an overarch of what it looks like in the world. And there are many, many more stats. When we look at South Africa in correlation, the pay gap is anywhere between 12 and 28%. Okay, so it's very close to that global average, but a little higher. Women equal 52% of our population, so that sex ratio is slightly different in our country. What's very interesting is that women in 2018 had outpaced men in secondary school completion and in achievement of tertiary qualifications. Yet, when we look at the JSC CEOs, only 3.3% of them are women. Very, very scary and stark fact about our country is that one of every two women in South Africa experience a form of gender-based violence in their lives. And I always say this, it's important to remember that this is a very sensitive issue 
and that the probability that there's someone in your team, your office, your client base, who's been a victim to gender-based violence is very, very high. And it's important that all of us prepare to manage unexpected reactions by committing to never invade individual privacy. We need to all learn to exercise being present and advice-free, as well as leveraging any employee assistance program or any other kind of support mechanism that we can leverage. And then looking at women in technology, which I thought would be pertinent for today. So I'm sure you've seen it, the Women in Technology study for 2019 revealed that women earn $300 less a week than male counterparts. So that's about 250,000 Rand a year, $16,000. Half of highly skilled women in tech leave their jobs when they have children. And a third of women older than 35 are still in junior positions. So yes, the data indicates that there's a massive problem and the gap to parity is just getting wider. It's not closing. But what's very important is that we need to frame the why. Why should we close the gap? There are many of us, some of us on this call today, that think, you know, there are gender roles that we naturally prescribe to, that it's natural, that it's just the way things are. But maybe the why can be answered when we think about some of the following facts. Um, McKinsey and company have been running research on women at work for decades, and I encourage you all to go to their website and read some of their reports. But they have found year on year that women are just as ambitious as men and want to succeed in their careers like men, whether they are parents or not. A full potential scenario in which uh, women are active in the global economy, identically to men, would add up to anywhere between 12 to $28 trillion to the global economy. So that would increase the annual global GDP um, and drastically kind of shift where the world is going by the year 2025 compared to a business as usual scenario. So looking at those two facts, women are just as ambitious, arguably, and that when women participate in the economy equally to men, it can solve a lot of our GDP problems and growth issues. And then finally, a global leadership study um, uh, uh, called the, um, Athena, the Athena Doctrine, run by a guy named John Gazerma many years ago, but it's still repeated today, said that women leaders exhibit most of the leadership traits required for the 21st century, so they, what they call a 21st century mindset. But at the end of the day, there are many ways to spin this message and to create a burning platform with a group of women like us today or with a group of uh, you know, mixed and diverse individuals. But I think really at the end of the day, what lessens one human lessens all of us. So I'd like to kind of start there and explore some of the unconscious parts of our minds. So I'd really like you to get some paper. I know lots of us type, but actually the act of writing is, is important. If you've got a piece of paper or a notebook with you, grab it. And when you look at this word on the screen, just jot down what comes to mind. So don't think about it too much. Just read the word and write down what comes to mind. One or two words, a sentence, a phrase. Okay, so let's really unpack this word feminine, feminist. You can put your piece of paper to the side. We're going to come back to it later. So there's the definition of the word feminist. Okay, at its core, feminism is the belief in full social, economic, and political equality for women. So, yes, that's a cool sentence, but when you unpack it, what it means is socially, you can wear whatever you want. Economically, you have the right to earn money, earn an income, save that money and spend it in the way you choose. And politically, you can have a political opinion, the freedom of voice and vote. When I think you put it that way, it, it, it changes the texture of what feminism really means. You've also got, um, and, and this is going to be a bit of a bounce uh, backwards and forwards through time. So bear with me here. We're going to 
jump to where we are today and then go back in time and just to unpack the richness of this word feminism. And I'm going very quickly because this is an hour presentation and I'm trying to cram it into the time that we have today. Um, so Lauren, just jump in if you need me to, if you need me to accelerate because I get quite passionate and, and run away with my words. No, no, I think everybody is quite intrigued uh, and uh, invested here. So you carry on, Taryn. Fantastic. And if I do drop, just wait 30 seconds. I'm going to connect via my phone, but I doubt I will. Perfect. Okay. So this is Simone de Beauvoir. Okay. She's known, often referred to as the first feminist, although she wasn't. She um, is a, a she was a French writer, intellectual, existentialist, philosopher, political activist, social theorist, the works. Um, but she's famous in the feminism world because she wrote a book called The Second Sex. It's about this big and you can use it just to stand up our, our laptops like we all sent the photos earlier. Um, but The Second Sex, this book, is what people call an act of Promethean audacity. And when I say Promethean audacity, what I mean is, if anyone here loves Greek mythology, uh, Prometheus was um, the god that uh, stole the Olympian fire and gave it to humankind because he loved humans. Um, and Zeus punished him gravely for that. But um, the reason why they call it an act of Promethean audacity is because there was no turning back after she shared this information and put it down in words. And the second sex is very famous for its um, phrase saying that um, uh, uh, men are born and women are made. Men are born and women are made. I could do a whole talk just on that phrase. Um, but that's Simone de Beauvoir. Then you've got um, uh, the opposite of the word feminism. So let's jump into considering what is the opposite of feminist. The opposite of a feminist is a misogynist which is a person that has hatred, contempt, or prejudice against women and girls. Then if we go back in time and think about where did this word come from, feminist, it actually was coined by a man, a man named Charles Fourier. Um, he coined the term back in the 1800s, and he was a very well-known utopian philosopher. So utopian, which means like the absolute, absolute ideal, and he kind of imagined and wrote about this perfect world where all are equal. So it's interesting to think that the word feminism and feminist comes from a man. We then fast forward to 2017 and have Emma Watson, who, you know, she's a good UN Goodwill ambassador. And she uh, launched a massive global campaign called He for She and did a very brave and powerful, vulnerable, authentic speech at the United Nations, was posted on YouTube. And when it went live, YouTube actually had to shut the comments down after an overwhelming amount of hate speech and misogynistic commentary, as well as violent death threats and rape threats to herself and anyone supporting her. Mostly from men, well, you can assume men, uh, uh, virtual uh, personas and avatars, we don't know who's who, but sadly, a lot of uh, female commentary as well. We then got uh, something called Feminist Inquiry, born out of feminism and feminist theory. And Feminist Inquiry is the search for unwritten, unspoken, unrecognized power dynamics and their effects on women, men, and children, so all people. So this is about inquiry, and this is a, a Feminist Inquiry is applied in academia across all spheres and all industries and all subjects. And it's about looking into what is unwritten who gets to write the rules and who doesn't? And what is the unspoken that can be surfaced? Jumping to the future again in pop culture, you've got Beyonce, the Queen Bee. So Beyonce strongly brought feminism into pop culture, publicly labeling herself as a feminist, and to some extent really commercializing feminism. You can then jump back, gosh, 3,000 years later, where we've got um, uh, one of the Tibetan deities uh, called the Green Tara. So this ancient Tibetan deity uh, was a princess and in the ancient text wanted to take a sattva. So a sattva is like a, a holy vow in Buddhism. And the men and the monks and the guides and the mentors really praised her meditation practice and thought she was excellent, a very excellent Buddhist but said it wasn't possible as she was female and she should really pray to return in her next life as a man. 
And on the spot, she vowed to never renounce being female or a woman and vowed instead to return as a woman in each of her lives to come. So you could argue that she was the first feminist. We then come back to current times, and this is Tarana Burke. Tarana Burke is one of the activists that started the Me Too movement. Me Too movement we know well is social movements against sexual abuse and sexual harassment where people publicize allegations of sex crimes. We then counter this against white feminism. And white feminism is a form of fem feminism that focuses on the struggles of white women while really failing to address distinct forms of oppression faced by ethnic minority women and women lacking other privileges. So white feminism is criticized for its feminist theories that focus solely on the experience of white women and fail to acknowledge and integrate the notion of intersectionality in the struggle of equality, intersectionality of race and culture. Um, so very, very prominent in the first waves of feminism, uh, you know, generally centered around the empowerment of white middle-class women in Western societies. If you watch Mary Poppins like me when you were a little girl, you learned about the suffragettes. Um, recently there was a, a movie about the suffragette movement, but those suffragettes actually voted against black people getting the vote. Um, so white feminism, feminism is something we all need to be very aware of and learn about. We've then got Alice Walker. Alice Walker, famous for writing the book, uh, The Color Purple, but Alice Walker coined the term womanism. And womanism is a form of feminism that acknowledges women's natural contribution to society. And it's used by some as kind of a distinction to the term feminism and its association with white women. So it's a social theory. It's learned about in gender studies and women's studies. And it's really based on the history and everyday experiences of women of color, especially black women. Um, and yeah, it's also at its absolute philosophical underbearings is um, based in restoring the balance between people and the environment um, and nature and to reconcile human life with the spiritual dimension. So that's a big one. Did you know that there are five waves of feminism? So we have the first wave in the, in the 1800s, which really focused on liberal social politics, so suffrage, the right to vote. There was then a massive gap, and only in the 1960s did the second wave of feminism come, come to bear, and it focused a lot on equality and discrimination, so a little bit more than just voting rights. Um, next came the third wave, where um, the idea of the media and how the media transmits ideas about womanhood, um, the words we use, the ideas we have about what a woman is, and it started to bring to light the concepts of in intersectionality. And then we entered the 21st century where the fourth wave of feminism came about, focusing very much on body shaming, rape culture, sexual harassment, using social media as the platform to highlight and address. And now we are living in the fifth wave of feminism, and the fifth wave of feminism is there to destroy current systems, build new ones, and bring social and political change to the world. Um, very important to bring um, uh, the pride flag up, the right to be different. Uh, part of the women's movement, born out of feminine, or feminist uh, uh, culture, rather. Um, and it's the women's movement paired with homosexuality or homosexuals and people who do not wish to commit to a traditional gender order. And, you know, these three groups have often supported one another. So feminism supports the idea that gender is fixed throughout our life um, uh, and identity cha identities change over the course of our lives. So ultimately gender parity and inclusivity is needed because you're not going to prescribe to something your whole life potentially. So there's now a new alternative spelling for the word uh, woman. And some of you might have seen it where the A, where the a is replaced um, with an X. And the spelling of the word woman with an X is used a lot in intersectional feminism and is an altern alternative spelling to avoid the suggestion of sexism or that um, woman is a se sequence to man. 
and it's also really in place to be inclusive of trans and non-binary women. So very, very popular in a lot of the forward-thinking organizations um, globally, not necessarily in South Africa. There's also big three arcs of feminism. You've got mainstream feminism, radical feminism, socialist feminism. So you're starting to see how this really unpacks. And Patrice Kulua, some of you know her. She's the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, artist, activist, um, and highlighting again that this feminist movement doesn't live alone. It exists in the movements of our time and all movements of social change. And then second last, we've got Yenenga. So if anyone is a, an Africanist here, they'll know about Yenenga. She's a legendary princess, um, considered the mother of the Mossi people of Burkina Faso. She was a famous warrior um, and her father adored her, but um, she really aspired to a different destiny and she didn't want to be a princess, but decided to leave the kingdom and live her life as a warrior. So these symbols of strong, independent, equal women who choose their destiny are not new. And then finally, we've got Barbie. So the world is changing out of this word feminist and this concept of feminism. And Barbie launched its first um, a range of inspiring women do dolls in 2018 after they surveyed thousands of mothers, I think it was 8,000 mothers, who expressed a desire for better role models for their daughters. Um, so the lineup has included Frida Kahlo, Rosa Parks, and the one on the screen here is Maya Angelou. So I want you just to take a look at what you wrote down next to the word feminist and see if maybe um, your mindset has changed. The ergonomics of your mind are a bit different. And uh, if the words that you've written compared to what's on the screen change the richness and complexity of feminism for you. So I'm quickly going to jump into another word, but it won't take as long. And that word is patriarchy. So on the same piece of paper, just in 10 seconds, maybe you can write down the words or thoughts or sentences that come up when you read the word patriarchy. Okay, so patriarchy is um, systemic um, and none of us have asked to live in it. But we could argue um, that we didn't really build it, but because it's systemic, we uphold it. So what is patriarchy? Patriarchy is a system of society or government where men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. Patriarchy is deeply ingrained in the fabric of our society, in the fabric of our ethics and our ethos as human beings. It means the control of property. So if you consider the control of property in the world, 40% of the economies in our world limit women's property rights. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was as early as 2001 where a woman still needed surety so a signature from her husband or her father if she wanted to own property i could be wrong it's either 1997 or 2001. Uh, considering patriarchy and political leadership based on all those um all the research papers to date it'll take us about 130 years till we have parity on the political landscape Patriarchy also refers to the moral authority. And globally, only 23% of the judges in the world are women. So we always need to ask ourselves the question about who gets to write the rules. And patriarchy also refers to social privilege and the special advantage, considering micro affirmations and microaggressions that we have to, that we are unaware of largely and have to deal with on a daily basis. So all of us grow on the system of patriarchy. So it's our duty to understand it, to know the system that we live in, that we thrive in or we suffer in. We're all part of the system. And even if you think one of the good guys, you're also kind of part of the problem. Something very important to note is that the patriarchy doesn't iterate. It was defined thousands of years ago and it has not changed, unlike the word feminist. So I'll just take a moment to pause here 
um, because this is often a part of this discussion where things get quite difficult for a lot of different people. So it's okay to be wherever you are. This is not a witch hunt um, and there's no right and wrong. But you do need to take the time and think about how you feel and then know why you feel that way. So I'll share this presentation afterwards and I think it's important that you take five, ten minutes to ask yourself these questions. But for now, let's just watch another quick video just to lift our spirits. I know you're really here to see Michelle. Or Oprah. Actually, they're together, so you're here to see both of them. I, I cannot compete with them. But, but I did want to stop by and make one thing very clear. I may be a little grayer than I was eight years ago, but this is what a feminist looks like. Okay, you just have to put Barack on the screen. Everyone seems to be very happy. So I saw a question earlier that came up on, you know, what can we do or how do we make a change? So that's what I want to get into now. And I'm sharing the IP of Gartner. If you have a Gartner license to their IP, you can share this. And I've got permission from them to share this as long as we credit them. And this is diving into one very simple way of how to make a change in your life, you know, as it stands today. So <clears throat> this piece of uh, information or this model comes from um, a presentation that was delivered by Gartner last year at their conference. And it's really on um, uh, calling out uh, or confronting behaviors that marginalize women, but anyone really. So it's just this ability to practice and call out marginalizing behaviors. So this is high-level guidance on how to confront those behaviors. Um, but I think it really helps when people are sitting there going, wow, okay, this is, this is hectic, and there's a burning platform, well, what can I do? So you can be an excellent corporate and public citizen, and you can think about these five things um, that help us manage not only the pipeline for marginalized groups and minorities, but can change things in your life today. So the five here are personal networks, creating internal um, and encouraging external network participation of women or minority groups, if you have the power to do so. Visibility, giving women or minority groups visibility wherever you can, in whatever capacity you can. Uh, if you are a manager or if you have access to a manager, holding them accountable to make sure that everything is evaluated from how you hire people to how you promote them. And then if you have the ability, if you're working in HR or you're in a position of power, really think about career interruptions and how you can embrace the career in interruptions of minority groups. But the one I'm going to talk to you today, is, the one I'm going to talk to you about today is confronting behaviors. Um, so confronting behaviors that marginalize underrepresented employees, women, for example, especially in technology, um, but anyone really. So the first one is to recognize the behavior. So this can sometimes be difficult, but often you get a gut instinct or you notice something that's happening. Um, you've got right and left brain activity here and we don't have time to go into all of that, but maybe someone's calling someone a pet name, there's ageism playing up, uh, maybe a little bit of profiling, gender profiling of a person, maybe someone's over explaining something, or maybe that's just generally you know, unprofessional. But the one I'm going to focus on today for this example is taking credits. So you notice that someone is taking credits for a marginalized uh, uh, participant's work, in this case, a woman's work. So the first thing to do is address it publicly, where you publicly address that you see someone is taking credit for, for someone else's work. Very simply, the next step is to coach privately. So privately pull that person aside and say, this is what the behavior that I'm noticing, and let me give you some specific examples. And it's important that we create an inclusive environment. The next step is to support privately. So 
to the victimized individual or the marginalized individual, you acknowledge with them what you've noticed and you let them know that uh, you're not comfortable with it and that you want to be there to support them. And then the fifth and last step is publicly you affirm. You affirm what you stand for and you affirm what maybe your organization or whatever body you're representing stands for. So five simple steps, recognize the behavior, address publicly, coach privately, support privately, and confirm commitment publicly. Okay? So this process works based on Gartner's research time and time again, no matter who's being uh, marginalized. So it sounds really simple and it sounds really easy, but it's very, very difficult. And you really need to be kind to your mind. So if any of you feel changed by this presentation or what you can think about, I implore you to be kind to your mind. Um, when we address issues of unconscious bias, or maybe some of our own biases that we're unaware of, it can be quite a painful process. It's not your fault if you are biased, it's human nature. We are taught directly and dangerously indirectly to be biased. And your brain is an incredible, primitive, flexible, ingrained and ambiguous thing. So you can see it's the polarity. Um, so you absolutely have the capacity to change, but you need to do it with compassion for yourself and for others. So I've got a short video, which I'm sure most of you have watched, but I'd love to play it for you again, and then we can have a quick discussion. Hi, Erin. Hi. Okay, so I'm gonna just give you some actions to do and just do the first thing that comes to mind. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. My hair. Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Aw. My name is Dakota and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. Sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So when they're in that vulnerable time between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person, it's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swim like a girl? Keep doing it because it's working. If somebody else says that running like a girl or kicking like a girl or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring and you're still getting to the ball on time and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean, yes, I kick like a girl and I swim like a girl and I walk like a girl and I wake up in the morning like a girl because I am a girl. And that is not something that I should be ashamed of. So I'm gonna do it anyway. That's what they should do. If I asked you to, to run like a girl now, would you do it differently? I would run like myself. Would you like a chance to redo it? Yeah. Why can't run like a girl also mean win the race? So thank you everyone. Does anyone have any questions? Karen, that was so awesome. Sure. I think um, just looking at the comments that have come up, uh, 
lots of people commenting. I've, I've made loads of notes and just what we've been taught and how we've been socialized. And I think um, everything to me was really important, but I just absolutely love those last five steps you left us with. Um, I think it's, you know, a lot of us see things that aren't right and you don't have the action plan of what I can do. And now, like, I feel like I do. I can recognize it. I can address it. I can coach. I can support and I can reinforce that um, behavior. And I just thank you. That was really awesome. Um, but yeah, any questions or comments, ladies? There are a few comments here. Okay, a couple of people have to drop off, but um, Michelle, Michelle Rousseau, you were commenting quite a bit. Any any questions or comments from you? So this is something I'm really passionate about, um, especially being in the IT industry, and I have been in the IT industry for nearly 30 years. Um, I've always had to report to men. Um, I've only twice had lady bosses, um, but never in very high senior positions. And I've just read a book as well that um, we mustn't think that just because we are in Africa uh, that it only happens here. It's happening in America. It's happening in um, Europe. And um, I really just think that we should all do what we can um, to make things better. And you know, especially for the young women that come after us. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Taryn. Um, you've just fired me up even more than I was after I read that book. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, let's all do what we can to change things. Thanks, Michelle. Any other comments or questions? I see Nikki has uh, put a great comment there. As ladies, stand up for yourself. Don't even consider that you're not good enough. It shouldn't even cross your mind. Fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else got any comments or questions for Taryn? Um, I did share her LinkedIn profile and, and her um, the um, website address was uh, on, her, on her front page. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, there's so many notes that I made, to be very, very honest, I don't quite know where to start. I think um, probably one of the biggest um, um, mindset to overcome is our self-worth and the fact that, you know, we deserve to be in positions of leadership, we deserve to be um, earning that, that the same amount, you know, and I think it's just how we've been socialized and what we've been conditioned to accept as normal. And um, I think you have ignited a, a, a fire for a few people here, Taryn, and just looking at the comments and seeing the reactions. And I just really hope it's something that everyone can take through this year and just make these small changes in language and behavior and, um, and an observation and and just really make those small differences because i think that's that's what counts is everybody doing their small little bit 100 percent. thanks lauren thank you everyone it was really a privilege to talk to you all today thank you very much really insightful um, thank you so much. Uh, as you said you could have gone on for quite a few more hours and i have no doubt about that um, but thank you so much, Taryn, really. If you don't mind just quickly dropping um, your uh, website address into uh, the chat, please. I didn't um, sure. I didn't pin it anywhere. Um, just so people can also go and have a look at that. Um, but yeah, unless and anybody got any comments or questions, any closing comments that you want to say before we bounce? There, Vanessa stole the words out of my mouth. Um, this great comments coming through there and absolutely fantastic. Oh, Taryn, thank you very much. Really insightful. Thoroughly, thoroughly um, enjoyed today's presentation. And, and Karika, thank you also. Um, and to all the WIT ladies on the call, thank you very much for joining us again this evening. Um, I hope that you're all ready for an Easter weekend. I'm sure lots of you are 
going to be waiting for tonight's um, update to see whether you're going to be the first people at the bottle store tomorrow or um, if you can relax a little bit. Um, but yeah, take what we learned and, um, today and just really digest it and think about how you can make small differences in your world and the young girls around you, how you speak to them um, and make make the like a girl something to be really proud of and aspire towards. So yeah, I'm going to love and leave you. Thank you very much for joining us today and have a fantastic and safe Easter weekend. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 Lauren, you'll remember to stop the recording. Um, I'm not the person that was, oh, oh it's me.